welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal people, and we do this one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate. Jeff? Hello. And me, Benjamin De Campos, a designer and believer. We choose a topic of interest, we spend a little time researching it, we have a discussion, then we publish the notes. Or do we publish the notes before we have the discussion, Jeff? No, we publish the notes after we have had the discussion. Long after we've had the oh, discussion. Oh, so people can't read along. No, because we publish the <laughs> podcast after we've published the notes. Oh, so all the time... But this discussion is happening before the notes are available. Ah, so all the time I've it's been saying... It's not a live podcast. I know it's not a live podcast, but... Oh, wait a minute. No, it still makes sense that you can be listening to the podcast and be reading along with the notes, right? Yes, okay. correct, because we have already recorded it. I thought I'd been saying something stupid for the last however long we've been doing this. No, you're okay. just saying something stupid now. Yes. Okay. Anyway, anyway, so you can read along with the show, with the notes, on our website, which is eclecticist.co.uk, and it's pretty much spelled as it sounds. And we do this to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die, and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we will be discussing in this episode is political correctness. Political correctness. What can we not say this week? Who will I offend if I speak disparagingly about potatoes? The Irish? Christ. Oh, wait. Oh, geez, Louise, son of a sea cook. Can I say that? Has the increasingly thin skin of the younglings given rise to the Trump phenomenon the sensible minority are all terrified about? A natural reaction to the eggshells we've all been forced to hover over? Social justice warriors. Happy now? Yes. Um, it's a tricky subject. I find it quite complicated. I, I don't think I really have a completely gelled opinion on this whole topic, but I'm, I'm aware that it is a thing and it seems to be quite popular in the, uh, the social news wires in right. the last couple of years. It's a real hot button topic. Um, and I've heard both sides of the coin, that being the anti-PC brigade, uh, where the very idea of politically correct speech is anathema to freedom of speech and is to be avoided at all costs. And then the other side, where people think it's a good idea to think about what you're about to say, before you blurt it out, lest you might unnecessarily and needlessly offend people. Mm. So I can kind of see both sides, if those are indeed the sides. Um, and I think uh, the, the, un my understanding of the term is I exactly that. It's not wanting or, or monitoring your speech or speech in general for any unnecessary offensiveness uh, and that's it um so i think yeah i don't really want to offend offend people needlessly but at the same time i don't want to be worried that i might offend some group of people perhaps a, an oppressed group of people unknowingly and then be brutally punished for that when there wasn't the intent to offend there. So I think that's sort of the difference between how I see political correctness and hate speech, I suppose. Political correctness kind of means that people just speak in such an anodyne way. They're just speaking in a way as to not offend anyone, but they're not really saying what they really think. That's something that I take out of this. Do you know what I mean? We, we don't really know what someone thinks because they're just trying to be as inoffensive as possible when they speak, reducing their utterances to just bland meaninglessness. I think you're right. I think, I think, I think if we're in a landscape of common discourse, but there are bear traps and alligator pits all over the place, 
then you're going to tend not to wander about too much. You're just going to go on a well-trodden path with a fairly straight route across. Whereas, if you were to remove the alligator pits and the bear traps, you would discover more about this landscape. So it's compromising our general ability to have enriching conversations because we're all so afraid of offending people. Mm. So it just shuts us up and that's bad for everybody because we're not having a, a bigger conversation. Well, I mean, it really is. And I've seen examples of this. I mean, th- there's a couple of notable examples in recent times of this delicate snowflake phenomena. You know, student uprising in various Ivy League colleges in the United States, you know, over racism, which is debatable. Halloween costumes, which is this whole cultural appropriation business, which we can talk about. Is this about. the killer clown thing? I don't, no, it's not. I think it was um, like Native American. No, it was like Mexicans, Mexican hats, things like that. Oh, right. Sombreros and handlebar mustaches. Yep. And maracas. <laughs> and, uh, but also Native Americans, that kind of thing. I, I think you mean indigenous American peoples. Yes. I said Native Americans. Can we not say that Which now? Is, I, think that's, <laughs> I think that's off the table. No, but I realize um, even by saying this, I'm, I'm actually talk, speaking the way that assumes listeners will know what we're talking about. But you've put this huge meaning in history thing into the show notes. Do you want to just rattle that off? Well, before I do, what, uh, what you were just saying was slightly different from where we started, right. which is a good tangent that we'll take a little bit later on, which is the delicate snowflakes mm. who are offended. Yes. Where has this sensitivity come from? So that, that's a conversation we'll have. But before we go there, let's, de- I think you're right. Let's, let's define this a little bit better. So at the beginning, I said, I think it's the monitoring of language and, you know, potential punishments for transgressors. And these transgressors are, uh, are guilty of offending or insulting typically minorities. That is to say, a minority in every, meaning of the word and oppressed peoples so people who feel as though they are some kind of general victim um and it's it's this offense uh in the dictionaries we have in the oxford english dictionary um which is free to access if you have a british library card i say this every time you do it, it amazes it amazes me uh it's such an amazing resource and the fact that it's free just blows my mind So in the Oxford English Dictionary, it says political correctness, advocacy or, oh, sorry, advocacy of or conformity to politically correct views, politically correct language or behavior. So that just tells you how it operates. And politically correct, the meaning is conforming to a body of liberal or radical opinion especially on social matters, usually characterized by the advocacy of approved causes or views, and often by the rejection of language, behavior, etc., considered discriminatory or offensive. So, I mean, there we have it. It's, it's a restriction of language, for sure. It's, it's, an, it's a negative to, to, to bequeath a positive. Another... Uh, definition from the new york review review of books political correctness as well as varied economic interests and anti-semitism dictate that no third world people can do wrong and no first world people right huh (laughs) so uh, a political correctness is just a way of pointing at whoever has the upper hand socioeconomically speaking that's basically the bbc's mo really hmm yeah, there's definitely something wrong about that person there because of privilege. Yes. Well, actually, I mean, I just want to just go back to something. The, the first thing you said, you, you said um, it affects minorities, and then you you were quite general about it. But I think it's it's not really, well, it's minorities, but I think more accurately, it's non-whites in the West is... Um, kind of the the center of this and it really is in the west Mm. and i think there's a lot of things you can say about just how trivial and meaningless and how pointless this is in 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 the global sense because you have people in the world who are suffering actually whereas here in the west we get concerned over the use of the male pronoun and all this kind of thing 
Indeed, in Saudi Arabia, you can you can suffer from not having a head if you uh, <laughs> say the wrong things about the uh, ruling regime. Mm. Uh, uh, but in the West, generally speaking, it's so ridiculously tolerant of speech uh, that it's just simply needs to to be curtailed, and we need to sort of uh, reduce the freedom of speech right down to the point where we have uh, equality with the other countries of the world, which I think is exactly what we don't want. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems as though that's what a lot of people do want. It's very peculiar. There's another definition here from the Urban Dictionary, um, which is sort of like a, a high-class version of the Oxford English Dictionary. Mm. Uh, an inverted fascist philosophy that absolutely no one should conform to unless they are an ignorant, bleeding-heart liberal idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so strong views on political correctness, generally speaking. Yeah. But uh, there are an absolute litany of... Uh, of euphemisms uh, when it comes to politically correct. And certainly you said pronouns there. And I remember some of these pronouns coming in many, 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 many years ago, particularly Ms. M.S. in order to denote a female. So it denotes gender, but not marital status. You used to have Mrs. M.R.S. and then Miss M.I.S.S. -S for Frau, for an unmarried woman. Uh, but now I've seen M.S. dot just saying I'm a female, um, which is important because, you know, I was just the other day, I was speaking to Valerie, uh, who was a man. So it's good to know these things. Really? Is in that advance, a, is... I think. Valerie, V-A-L-E-R-Y is a, an East European name. Oh, right. Well, there's like Hillary, Valerie. which is a British male name. Hillary, yeah, Hillary is a, well, it's a different spelling, though. Hillary with uh, two L's yeah, male name. Yeah, but you don't see the line. spelling when someone's when saying, saying Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Fair cool. Enough. All right, so yeah, we so I kind of brought up this uh, th this delicate snowflake phenomena and all the um, things we've heard about in these Ivy League institutions in the United States. But it's not just that. I think many of us will probably have a story about or some anecdote about someone taking offense at something completely innocuous. And and just the other day, someone I know um, was saying that a friend of hers posted on Facebook a kind of uh, one of those annoying comments from someone saying, oh, God, I can't put on weight. I don't believe this um, because she feels she's too thin. She doesn't have an eating disorder. She's just showing off that she has such amazing uh, metabolism. Did you say, there's no worry there. You're fat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if someone I know would have said that, I might have done. I'm not sure. Anyway, but so something is just totally silly and annoying and, and completely innocuous is that. Sure enough, someone sent them a private message saying, um, I think you need to delete that comment because uh, there are a number of um, bigger people. Obviously, you don't say fat. No, no. <laughs> you no. don't even say more, large more anymore. Curvaceous. I think you, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> corpulous. Um, you know, who, who might take offense at that. You should at least put, you know, a CW. And I didn't know what this means, but a CW means a content warning. So what this person should have done, well, should have done is not say anything at all, but they should have at least put a, like a, a, um, a disclaimer at the very front of that message saying, you know, if you're likely to take offense at this kind of thing, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, all, all of this. And for people who aren't, confrontational i can well imagine stuff like that would just make people just totally retreat into their shells mm. and you know what's the end result of this well as i said in the little opening trump being our president-elect but well as a backlash yeah for sure mm -hmm. so <clears throat> there's this guy jonathan height uh, and he spoke about this recent phenomena of safe spaces and trigger warnings and microaggressions and all of this. And he put a lot of this down to parents overprotecting their kids. So, for example, you and I, Jeff, when we were young, you know, our parents pretty much let us do anything we wanted. And so we went out and got lost and got scared, got beaten up, um, all of this kind of stuff and kind of developed um, a type of toughness that kids or the younger generations don't have. Now, the reason why, he, he puts it, is that there was this crime wave um, and lots of sensational news reporting about abductions, which 
rarely happen, but because you know the news makes huge stories of these things, it's put the fear up, put, put the fear into kids, uh, into parents rather, and um, so parents are just swaddle their children. But you, Jeff, you are a parent. I, 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 I before you go there, I, I heard that it happened much later on. It happened in university, where because of the of the commercialization of um, of education, further education particularly, you have lots of of retrograde courses that actually damage humans and their ability to interact with the real world. So lots of sort of uh, um, what is it, gender studies and um, black studies, and you know, entire degree courses which just teach you how oppressed you are and how, how terrible everything is. And by the time you come out of it, you're thinking, my God, what kind of disastrous hellhole am I living in? And then, you know, they're building victims. They're making people into victims. You know, it's like, it's like getting those cold calls, those robotic cold calls saying, you know, um, do you remember that accident that you were in that wasn't your fault? You know, do you want to, uh, you know, maybe you should take action, uh, you know, against your aggressors and all the rest of it. And similarly in football, I was watching football for absolutely no reason the other day. And, uh, one of the players took a dive, uh, you know, big, strong, strapping, peak physical health, uh, football player. Uh, suddenly just, you know, someone taps him maybe, you know, gently on the, buttock and he's thrown into the air and he's you know it's he's in 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 a rigor mortis amount of uh writhing pain yes. on the ground and they have to bring out the magic sponge and it's it's like it's like a performance it's like people want to be offended publicly they want other people to see them being offended and then they can react in a sort of performance and it's all nonsense <laughs> people really aren't offended but they they gin themselves up to be offended and they even believe it and they get into a frenzy of offense and you know you forget what 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 the offensive remark was or who made it or mm. what it even means and i just think it this sensitivity isn't an increase in sensitivity to offense more it's filling some kind of void this is like a hobby it's it's some sort of <laughs> some sort of um Something you can do uh, to, to maybe draw attention to yourself in a world where attention is absolutely everything and you just need to be a victim. And people people want to be an oppressed minority. They actually think, you know, that, that gives me an upper hand. You know, at least I have that a crutch to lean on. I think there is some truth to that. And in fact, I think there's a, there's a lot of truth in that. I think it's just an opportunity for arseholes to be annoying and cause other people distress of some kind it's just another way for people to be terrible to other people but i do think there was something in jonathan Haidt's conjecture on this subject that in the early 80s there was a crime wave um and then from that point onwards kids were more and more protected and not allowed to sort of toughen up and so i, I was going to ask you jeff um you, about your your parenting not to get too personal but do, do your kids have the same freedoms that you had? Do, do you allow them to do the same things? Do drugs? Well, when I was, yeah, when I was a kid, I had the freedom to meet my dealer, uh, with whom I don't know how I could have gone on. Kill cops. Having, have met. Yeah. And the graffiti and, um, the law, the, the, the week long walks along the rail tracks, uh, setting fire to the homes of old people. Yeah. Arson. Um, yeah, all of it. Shooting cats. Uh, it was great. It taught me a lot. It taught me what the inside of a prison cell looks like. Uh, I think, I don't think the children, today's children are overly sensitive. I think parents may be overly sensitive, but I think the kids themselves haven't really changed that much over the decades. I think kids speak the truth. They're much more honest than parents and adults, generally speaking. Uh, they're a lot less sensitive. I mean, they're transiently sensitive. You know, they'll get you really m immensely upset about something for about five minutes, and completely forget about it and move on to something else. Um, they have, they have no, they have. What age are you talking about here? Uh, anybody up until 
Puberty. Okay. All right. I think kids, just kids, kids, generally speaking. Right. Um, it's only when they start becoming educated that it seems to become a problem and probably not for most. It's probably just a few alarmists. You know, I think that the phenomenon of Trump is because the majority of people see this ridiculous nonsense for what it is. It's a minority of people who seem to be pulling the ship around. And I think it just it just won't stand. I mean, you know, be offended. That that seems to be the cry now from the majority of people living in most of the countries in the West. You know, don't cry to us. Uh, you know, be offended. Toughen up. Uh, this is the real world. Get over yourselves. Um, but at the same time, you know, the liberals will generally say, look, you know, what's the harm in thinking a little bit about what you're about to say? You know, let's... Let's not try to marginalize people. Let's not try to generalize. And let's try not to be a bigot. And this is a word that's just thrown around with gay abandon. It's like, you know, I think bigotry is something that the Americans particularly simply don't understand the meaning of, like irony. Like they don't know what it actually means. So bigot gets thrown around, but it's like, hang on a minute. <laughs> You're you're the bigoted one because you're the one who's curtailing uh, the common language and and reducing the 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 conversation. Well, I I don't know why you lay that at the feet of Americans. I think people on in your country are just as bad. It's not a word that's thrown around as much. I, I don't hear it every single day here, but really? I see it every single time I look at any kind of American media. Right? Yeah, I don't think it happens that often here. But the the problem is is that. <laughs> political correctness per se is bigoted because it is a, a a direct refusal to countenance salty language uh and uh you know i do have sympathies for not wanting to offend and i think offense is fine as long as it's not directed and and used in a way to hurt or damage people for for no for no obvious gain i think that's a problem i think that's more hate speech you know to just attack somebody and insult them or their culture or any identifiers without enriching the conversation i think is something we indeed should avoid and perhaps that's where the whole notion of political correctness came from. But I think it's gone, if that is the case, then it's gone far too uh, far in the other direction. Uh, we, we've, we've passed the point of uh, equanimity, equanimity. Can't pronounce it. Equanimity? Yeah, that's the one. Uh, so I think that that's the problem. That's The problem is we really are moving into a world of new speak where, you know, it shuts everybody down because they just can't be bothered to do the ridiculous amount of research it would take to ensure everything they're about to say is not going to offend somebody in our multicultural society. Mm, yes. And we should also say why it is that people cave in. I think it's because people who are offended are pretty damned powerful. So, for example, if teacher says something that one student has found upsetting or is traumatized by it. So this is this new thing. It's like people don't just get upset. They become traumatized and damaged by one word that someone may say, perhaps accidentally, or someone got the wrong end of the stick. People who are offended are pretty damned powerful in this age of social media. So this is what I mean about someone could be destroyed for saying things. And that's why people don't say things, or they try not to, or they, they avoid subjects that are like hot potatoes, you know, for example, Black Lives Matter, you know, it's just, that's just a conversation that a white person cannot have. They just can't. Unless they speak in such a sort of servile tone <laughs> and be, are constantly condemning themselves for their ancestors' colonialism and all that kind of thing. People just don't want to go there. Well, it's not only that they don't want to go there, but they can't go there because it isn't a two-way conversation. If you were to start criticizing Black Lives Matter, 
the advocates of Black Lives Matter will shut you down. Well, this is what I'm talking they will about. Not, they will not listen to what you're saying. So it's not your unwillingness to engage in a conversation. It's the fact that they are bigots and they will not hear your point of view. Mm-hmm. And they will just stick their fingers in the ears and go, la, 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 I don't think so. Doesn't that sound like we're in the supernatural arena? Like that's a kind of becoming a religion like Black Lives Matter and all those things where it's there's like dogma if you speak transgressively about any of these things. It's like, oh, my yeah, God. <laughs> I, I think it, I think it, it's it's anti reason. It's irrational and it's pressing against one of the key pillars of Western society, which is freedom of inquiry. You know, it's like, hang on a minute, let's examine the evidence, let's examine the facts, and let's have a conversation about it. You can examine the facts and you can examine the evidence, but we're not going to have a conversation about it. And this is an attack against the power of language. Language is incredibly powerful, and if it weren't for language, you know, perhaps we'd still be hunter-gatherers, or perhaps not even that sophisticated. Language is unbelievably uh, key to the human experience. And once you start taking issue with language and, and, and slowly strangling it, then you are damaging society and, and pushing, you know, slowing down progress and, you know, meaning to push us backwards. Uh, and, and that, again, this is the freedom of speech issue. But be wary of any initiative that is concerned with reducing our ability to express ourselves i mean even at the risk of offending people who may or may not be increasingly easily offended i think it's a real problem and it's a real issue and we should absolutely have a conversation about it and i think trump and the you know he's the only politician well i say politician he's not a politician but he's the only one in the political arena arena who says, uh, you know, let's political correctness is destroying America, you know, hyperbole, perhaps, but we'll see what he says and, and see what measures he may or may not take. But certainly, if he uses his position to stop conversations from being stopped, well, then that'll be a, a huge leap in the right direction, I think. Um, yes, I think I agree with some of that. I generally kind of boil this down to just plain old narcissism. Don't you think that plays, that's a huge part of this uh, offended generation? I'm a lot less offensive than you are. I'm a lot less offensive than you are. I could out not offend you anytime. Is that what you mean? I don't know it's that. I just think... I'm better at being not offensive? I don't know. It's like these, um, this uprising in the in these universities you mean the, the marketplace of ideas that universities have not become well we could talk about that i wrote that here in the show notes that um we should discuss discuss the notion that universities shouldn't be a place where students encounter opinions that differ to theirs and so this is the whole safe space phenomena which just sounds just totally ridiculous so basically they want universities to become these echo chambers and anyone that is counter to the echo chamber need to be swiftly dispatched. Yeah, I think it, it's. It, I mean, the political correctness. I suppose it stretches to contentious ideas. You know, if you were to talk about something that would be seen as contentious by perhaps the majority of people, then I'm trying to think of a topic that would be. Then it's impolitic of you to voice it right so rather than in i say the old the olden days but before let's say to perhaps a non-existent past uh you were able to say what's on your mind Mm. and then reap reap the wrath uh so and and that's 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 a way you learn right so i say something that's on my mind and then I may have my reputation destroyed. I may be publicly pilloried, uh, or people may agree with me, and I may have uh, aired dirty linen that a lot of people uh, rally rally to my side um, in defense. But you, you'll not discover any of the outcomes 
if you don't raise the topic. And I think we've gotten to a place where we've been beaten back to the point where, as you say, we just retreat into our shells and all of that potential conversational goodness is just snuffed out before before it's even aired. That That is the threat. That's the threat that I see. I, I've heard so many encounters and uh, conversations and all sorts of things online where the antagonist will pull out this trump card. Not Trump. I don't think we can say trump card anymore. <laughs> There's just so, too much baggage. It has, a different, it has a different meaning. Yeah. But anyway. We'll, we'll, well, a trump card means you win. Yeah. But no, but even so. Just it's true. Just, <laughs> it's just so distracting, Trump just being you know in line in a sentence. But anyway, well, if if there's any kind of discussion between a person of color and a white person, it's perfectly okay to say something like, "Well, as a white person, you wouldn't understand," or and it's just this double standard where you could just be as disparaging as you want because, well, come on, white person oppressors. Uh, we just need to roll the clock back, you know, a couple of centuries to uh, see what all white people are really like. I mean, come on, we can't trust these people. And then there's no sort of like comeback to that. It's like, oh, okay, well, you win. But it, it's it's just racism, but in the other direction. But that, that's fine. I don't think you're allowed to say that, but I agree. Uh, that's exactly what it is. So, and this is the problem. Well, hang on, what am I? I, I what think am I, I think not allowed to say. You're not allowed to say that that's racism, but in the other direction. Oh, yeah. That's tantamount to being a racist. Okay. I just thought I'd point that out. Um, so I think a, a real complicating factor is multicul- multiculturalism. Right. So when you have heterogeneous societies that have, you know, clades uh, or are clinal in that they have sort of, you know, defined areas of culture uh, with hard divisions, then it's not scalable. Political correctness just won't scale. You can't say anything without somebody being offended. Someone somewhere is going to take offense. It's impossible not to offend at least someone. So Mm. it's going to happen. So, you know, you're going to be cracking eggs everything, every time you say anything. And you'll be thinking to yourself, is this cumulative? Uh, I offended 18,000 people just then. But the next thing I'm about to say, is that going to put me over the threshold? It could be about 500,000 people who could potentially take offense Mm. to what I'm saying. So, you know, script writers (laughs) are going to have a real hard time. Uh, All script writers will will be lawyers um, because... If being offended becomes weaponized, then we can all expect lawsuits with anything we ever publicly say. And this is like trickle-down offense. You know, it goes from the the public sphere of celebrity where, you know, someone can say something and 300 million people hear it all the way down to, you know, your personal interactions where everybody's policing each other you know, in a completely Stasi state-like way. And (laughs) it's it's hard to see an upside. I mean, even if we got to a place where nobody ever says anything offensive to anyone, that doesn't sound like a good place to me. It should sound like a good place because nobody's being offended. But in fact, nobody's saying anything. No, it's, it's, (laughs) it's so not a good place. There's two horrible extremes here. And it's just so depressing to just contemplate this. So you have this Trump phenomena who is potentially going to normalize abuse. (laughs) Okay, so he's going way too far the other way because he's being totally overt in insulting women and minorities and all this kind of stuff, just in really nasty, unproductive ways. And then we have this other side, which is basically going to reduce comedy. Now, I like comedy, but comedy is going to become so anodyne. Everything's going to be just Terry and June or Leave it to Beaver or just the most boring, bland, unfunny type of comedy. Well, being funny, I think, always has to walk that fine line between, I don't know, cleverness and... uh, What's what's a word that I could use? Just slightly controversial areas. Subversive. Subversive, there you go, that's the word. And I think that's that's very important. And that's why I think people just need to grow thicker skin. And, you know, if, if, particularly if you're, if, if, if you're being satirical. Now, I mentioned earlier about someone saying, as a white person, you wouldn't understand. 
do you remember a couple of years ago this there was a kind of movement that never really got off the ground called cancel colbert like this is probably a mostly american thing so maybe you wouldn't have heard about it quite so much but there's a satirical comedian called stephen colbert in this country who kind of made a joke about some owner of an american sports team who wasn't going to change the name of his sports i think it was like the redskins or the something like that redskins yeah and he made washington redskins i think it was it it was definitely something native american-y you can tell neither of us are must, must be the people. Redskins. But anyway, so he so he he wasn't going to change the name of his team, but instead he kind of issued this statement where he hoped it would like appease some people, but it was so clumsily worded, it was even more offensive. And this Stephen Colbert, the satirist, made this joke about how he's going to make a charitable contribution to the Ching Chong dynasty for oriental study and all this kind of stuff. And people took huge offense to that rather than taking offense to what he was satirizing. They, they found that offensive. <laughs> We're not going to call them the Redskins anymore. We're going to call them the Featherheads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But can, can, can we laugh at that? Anyway, but we had some, some woman who, who made a lot of capital for herself by um, being very public in her... Uh, denouncing Colbert and started this whole cancel Colbert campaign. And she, she would just go on talk shows and talk about how white cultures don't understand and would say things like, as a white person, you wouldn't get it. And white humor is so terrible. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but it's along those lines. And uh, that's that crazy double standard. Sensible people don't seem to have any comeback to. Because we can say, um, hang on a minute, you're being just as bad or whatever. But it doesn't matter. There's so much stink on you for even being in that conversation to begin with that there's just no winning this game. So it's not a level playing field. Basically, it's affirmative action for identity politics. Uh, you know, by being a whatever color person you are, you are on these starting blocks and this area is out of bounds and this area is out of bounds, but you have an advantage over these people. So I think it's, <laughs> again, it's the hypocrisy of it. It just, just blows my mind. But funny that Stephen Col- Colbert fellow, he used to have a whole show where he was in character pretending to be a sort of center right or maybe even middle right yes. uh, character. And most of his comedy was because he was such an outrageous right winger. Yes. Uh, and it was only until he dropped that act when he stopped being funny. <laughs> but but he said a lot of controversial things that were certainly politically incorrect. Uh, but be, it was okay because it was satire. Exactly, it's so satire. It's, it's, it's ironic. So so unless we prefix everything we ever say with "I'm being satirical here," but you're totally you're ugly. You uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the Ricky Gervais school of comedy, where he just basically, I think. Um, I think Private Eye did a good little send up of that where he could just say whatever the hell he wants. Fact is that they are, he is making those jokes and he is being nasty, but it's okay because he's making fun of people who either laugh at that kind of thing or say those sorts of things. Oh, that's okay then. That loophole. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, a lot of comedy is politically incorrect because it's funny. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of comedy to be had there. And I agree that, you know, it's under attack. You know, if you start banning certain types of speech or you start um, extending the scope of the definition of, of what the criteria for hate speech is, then, you know, it's the same thing. You know, you're not allowed to satirize this. You're not allowed to say this about these people. Um Legally speaking, so, you know, expect punishment if you mention anything about this or that. And that's a real slippery slope and I think should be avoided at all costs. And I think you're right when you say people should just grow a thicker skin, but you can't just say that, of course. So you have to wonder, where is this thin-skinned person coming from? What What is it that we are seemingly more sensitive to offense. Is it that more people are being offensive or is it more people are taking offense? I think it's the latter. 
But why is it happening? Is it because of social media? Is it because we're being told what to think? We're being told we're victims? Is it because of a sense of inequality that people have uh, an increasing feeling of? Or I think it's a whole peculiar. combination of things. But I, I'm firmly in Jonathan Haidt's camp where he thinks it's to do with parent, parents overprotecting their kids and the kids aren't exposed to all of these things. And when they come out in the real world and they discover what the real world's like, they just can't deal with it. Yeah, it's odd. I've, I've written here... Um, <laughs> under triggered uh, supposed or assumed right to defensive offensiveness so even before you've been harmed with uh, politically incorrect speech you can immediately attack by saying something like you know you're a racist sexist classist pig um, it's fine because i'm defending myself so or, or a disproportionate response uh, you may say something that's you know anybody in the room might think is uh, a mild disparagement, but I can immediately just destroy you with filthy profanities because you've given me license to. You know, your microaggression has opened up the tirade. It's interesting that you say that because uh, I just watched this video that went viral. I might have to send you the link. It's so amazing, but it might be unfair for me to even talk about it because it's clearly someone who is way, way on the fringe. Is that the right use of that term, on the fringe? What does that on the fringe mean? An extremist. An, an extremist, basically. Okay, so who's someone who's on the fringe. Basically, this uh, social justice warrior is taking a Lyft ride. Do you have Lyft in the United uh, Kingdom? No. You have no, U- Uber? Just, Uber is here. Yes. Okay, it's basically like Uber, but it's Lyft. And she just went nuts at the driver. And she's filming the whole thing. Because the driver had like a little Hawaiian doll stuck to his dashboard. And she was just just hammering this guy about how offensive that is because um, it's cultural appropriation on his part because it's disrespectful to the continent of Hawaii, as, as she puts it. And she keeps how doing all this. cultural appropriation? Was he wearing a grass skirt? Well, he no, but he, she kept doing all this and giving him a hard time. And he's being super nice. And... Um, she keeps saying that, you know, as a privileged white person. And then he says, look, I'm Asian. Not that there's anything to do with it, but but she, but she didn't stop. And she kept, she was like calling him like a really nasty names. And so as other people have pointed out, this is someone with license to be nasty to someone. It's like, hmm. so there she is, this big shot in the back of this cab, just really pounding on this guy in the service industry because she had license to do she had license to do so exactly i think um you said that someone had license um to just explode yes and attack somebody verbally um there's a difference between having a license to do so and using that license and i think it's the use i mean maybe we're all so suppressed and our speech has already been so um, strangled that any excuse to just let go, um, and, and we will, and we'll take pleasure in it, and we'll film ourselves and upload it to YouTube because we're going to say, look, look at how insulted I was, but look, look how I responded and defended myself. You know, we're all brothers and sisters. That sort of thing. And there's a, there's a, a television program called Black Mirror, uh, it's by Charlie Brooker, uh, who's a writer, broadcaster, critic in this country. Um, and this is a, a sort of Twilight Zone series of self-contained stories that takes a very bleak outlook on the uses of technology and the effects that future technologies or possible future technologies will have on society. Black mirror, mirror meaning display screen on your mobile or you know, computer screen. And the first episode in the latest series, which are all available on Netflix, um, the first episode starred Bryce Dallas Howard, who I think is a fabulous actor. Um, I can't say actress any longer. I have to say actor. And it's about how everybody is living in Facebook and we all have to be liked. And our like, our number of likes that we have is who we are, basically. And whatever it is we need to do, we need to make sure we're liked. Uh, so in order to be liked, we have to like. So every small transaction that we might have during a day, we'll rate it. 
So we go to our favorite barista at our favorite coffee shop and we'll just buy a product. And uh, we can't just receive the product. We also have to thumbs up, mega smile, maximum rating, thank you very much. Even if it's terrible. It doesn't matter. You just have to pretend you like everything and not offend anybody at all. Because if you do, or anybody takes offense for any reason, and your likes go down, then your social standing goes down. And along with your social standing, everything is linked in, like your your purchasing uh, power and, you know, everything, everything. And in this little story, it's the it's someone, this, this Bryce Dallas Howard's character, just plummets, just absolutely needs to have a high number of likes in order to buy this new house, but finds herself just plummeting and plummeting and plummeting and getting increasingly angry at, and insulting people and becoming a horrible person that, you know, you have to be in order to live in this world. And at no point does she actually realize that she's a horrible person, which is peculiar. And spoiler alert, but at the very end... Oh, uh, Jeff, careful. Do you need to do this? Okay, but, but, but the, <laughs> at the very end, you realize just how ridiculous that is and nobody can maintain this facade of political correctness because you're lying to yourself. If you're not expressing what you actually feel it, because you're in fear of something, then you are living in an oppressed world or you are somehow oppressed. So the moral of the story is you must be able to say what you want to say because you must be able or permitted to face the consequences because that will shape you as a human. And that's how we improve, right? Everything from evolution to artificial intelligence, it's all about making mistakes and learning from your mistakes and moving forward as an individual in order to participate in a group of people. But when you retard this you know, important mechanism for self-improvement, then it, it denigrates society's ability to produce better people. So you degrade society in general. (laughs) And I think that's what's happening with political correctness. It's making the world we live in worse and not better. So it's exactly the opposite of what it set out to achieve. And this needs to be realized. It needs to be broadcast. And uh, we just need to all be aware of what it is we're doing. And I think things like multiculturalism, non-assimilating multiculturalism, is is a big barrier to breaking down this this ridiculous direction. Um, Wall, rather. And that's what I think. So that's, that's, the, that's the terrible side of how I see all of this. So what's the state of multiculturalism currently in England, as you know it? Um, so there, I mean, there are lots of different cultures in the country I live in and it is very cosmopolitan. I live in London, which, you know, has every possible culture you can imagine all living with each other reasonably peacefully, but not, not as assimilated as you might want Different cultures assimilate to different degrees. I think um, Sikhs and um, Hindus, they seem to integrate quite well, whereas Muslims tend to integrate less well, generally speaking, it would seem. Um, So you have different peoples who identify themselves as a people, as a group. uh, And you'll never have total integration. I mean, you certainly won't have cultural integration, obviously, uh, because they, there are different cultures who consider themselves to be an inclusive culture. So, you know, what are you going to do? You have different groups of people. You don't think we'll ever achieve that? Oh, I, I think maybe it's possible one day, but then there will only be one culture. You can't have multiculturalism and perfect assimilation and integration. It's why not a contradiction in terms. You either have multiple cultures or you have one culture. If there is only one culture and you have a completely homogenous society, well then, you know, it's hard to offend somebody from another culture when there are no other cultures. Mm. Uh, North Korea is probably, you know, they're, they're limited in just how offensive they can be to each other on cultural terms. Um, and limited for other reasons as well, I'm sure. Yeah, so 
And in terms of speech, I think the lines between accidentally offending someone or deliberately, mildly offending someone or deliberately, hatefully speaking about someone. These are different categories, but I think they're blurring together in a dangerous way. And soon anybody who takes offense at anything will think hate speech has been instigated against them and they'll take a disproportionate amount of offense. Mm. And then once that becomes legalized, then it'll become weaponized and then that immediately leads to this uh, this blackening, and I don't mean it how you think I mean it, blackening, bl- blackening of the social discourse. And people just are turning off the lights and hiding in a room in their house and never mm. coming out. Yeah, that's so we'll right. Get a, so we'll get a greater degree of isolation. And I think rather than silos of cultures, we'll have silos of individuals and we'll only ever communicate with each other online and it'll get to the point in the far future, I can believe that even conversations online, you'll probably just leave that to your avatar, to your little AI will do your talking for you because your AI won't make mistakes like you will and won't offend anybody. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's the road to total spiritual homogenization we're, we're heading on. I remember what I was going to say earlier, and that was when you spoke about how you could immediately shut people down before they've really got going in whatever they were going to talk about by shrieking racist, bigot, homophobe, and all that kind of stuff. The obvious concern there is devaluing those words because you're not using those words correctly. When the occasion does arise where someone is being a racist, sexist, or or, or as you put a classist pig, it's the boy who cried wolf. Yeah, you you are eaten by the wolf because simply nobody's listening to you. (laughs) Because you're just being a drama queen. (laughs) Exactly. And everybody will be. And and real oppression will go undetected. Yeah. Uh, So, again, more suffering. But I was thinking about how, um, how, so we talk about celebrities and, you know, the public sphere and how offense is taken and viewed. But personally in your personal relationships where it's one-on-one and it's individuals who can actually touch each other um because of course group is a an abstraction Uh, how is it enforced how is political correctness enforced so i thought again it would be insidious it would be it would start off it's polite it's an emergent sort of consideration uh and it would be through awkwardness you know you'd conform because you wouldn't want to be seen as being awkward for starters and then you know it's like how most people start smoking it's just because it's there it's available it's not being pushed on you particularly but you feel as though you'll be participating in the group if you partake um so slowly but surely you're subscribing to this uh rejection of expression and uh and and you'll find yourself nodding in conversations where you really don't agree so you you're passively agreeing to things that you know you really don't fully believe in but you don't want to have to go through the hassle of having a conversation or heaven forfend a, an argument uh it's just we're we're it's like we're sleepwalking now we're sleepwalking towards this beige lands featureless landscape uh that's incredibly narrow and on rails i thought you said we're not doing any uh sam harris buzzwords (laughs) what what did i say that sam harris would say sleepwalking towards i i i'm sure he did not originate this all right sleepwalking goes right back to foucault and you have to be careful with the pronunciation of his name um, but just just on that subject, I think basically you need to be fearless. And I think most of us aren't. I don't think you need to be fearless. You do need to. Of course you need to be fearless. No, no. It, no if, if you're going to challenge someone, you have to be fearless. You don't need to be fearless. Of course not. Why do you say of course not? Because you can't be fearless. You always have some fear. Perhaps you need to be less fearful than others, but fearless 
No, no, no. It doesn't require that. It doesn't require some sort of non-human monster. I didn't say non-human. It just require- well, Jeff, you were being weirdly pedantic here when I said fearless. Why? Yeah, but because that that's like saying, that's like saying, um, you know, I need a I need a weapon to go and kill that rabbit, and, and then you say, yeah, you need a Panzer tank to kill that rabbit. No, 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 no. that's super overkill. You just need a small weapon. You don't need to be fearless. It was maybe a little it, bit. We don't need a hero to do. Is this, this what we need to yeah, do? Yeah, I know, now? I know, but it's a, no, but it's it's important <laughs> to say, look, it's it's not beyond reach to turn all of this around. We don't need some kind of um, Virgilian hero. We need to just allow people to be offended. Allow it. And let's see what they come back with. <laughs> let's have that conversation. Let's, I, I guess, you know, it's the universities that's the problem. Because the university, the whole point is that you are introduced to new challenging ideas and thoughts and have discussions which are... You know, perhaps discussions that you may never have had before and from perspectives that you didn't know existed, but that's what colors you in as a person and pushes us forward in thought. And it's the attack on that that is the real um, clarion call to action. It's the idea that people are going to universities, the very places where you have rich discussion, and yet they're pulling the pages out of the dictionary. Okay, well, this is why you need to be fearless, and I will stand behind that term. It's because in that whole Mizu debacle, the principal had to resign. He had to resign from his job because of this nonsense. And so, in order for someone to actually, you know, stand up and be counted and, you know, say what's right, they're going to have to not be fearful of losing their job. I, I disagree. There, there is a chap who is fighting political correctness at his university. I don't think he has tenure either. And he is taking risks. And he says he is fearful of losing his job. But he just cannot put up with this sort of oppression coming from the student body. He just thinks it's ridiculous. He, he says, as, as faculty, we've completely had all of our powers stripped away. And now we have the administrators running everything, and they're so hypersensitive to any kind of disruption or anything that might tarnish the reputation of the university uh, that, you know, they'd far rather fire members of faculty than bring the students in and try to speak reason to them. Uh, so it's a, a reaction, an overreaction, uh, an oversensitivity to anything that might. And, and, and as you said earlier, it could be the power of social media. You say pe- these people are powerful. It's true. I mean, if you roll around on the ground clutching your knee and say, you know, you've been wronged and you're, you've been traumatized online to all of your friends and your 50 million Twitter followers or wh- whoever, then as ludicrous as it may seem to you and everybody else, you have to take it seriously. It's like it's a numbers game. And uh, <laughs> it's a terrible, a terrible numbers game. But... Is it the fault of young people um, just because it seems like it's a new big thing uh, and we have social media and we know that 95% of people who use social media are, you know, 20 or under? Um, is it their fault or are they being made into victims? Is this a whole industry of victimhood the problem? So I, I, I don't think anybody has identified the actual problem. Where, where is this oversensitivity coming from? Is it just coming from minorities or is it coming from white knights, so-called people who rush to the aid of minorities who are affected or, or afflicted by uh, fruity talk? Well, I, I already said what I think it is. I, I, I said it was a combination of things, but I think it's mainly because kids are mollycoddled. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's wrong i think these days you know in in the west certainly children have better access to information which i always thought would make them smarter which i think they are uh but also they are protected i suppose from perceived threats if not you know because i don't think they're actually real threats really well okay no no well here's something now, I don't know if this is true in the United Kingdom, but here in the United States, it is actually illegal to have your kid unaccompanied walking around the neighborhood. What do you mean? 
What, what, what kid meaning under what age? I think it must be in the single digits. Um, it's kind of weird. No, I don't think that's a law here. But but in this country, if you you sort of have to tell schools whether or not your child is walking to school on their own. I think it's optional, but you can tell a school, yes, my kid is going to be walking, uh, just so they know. It's not a legal requirement or anything, but that's as close as I think we get here. But uh, Molly call them. Again, children these days have access to an enormous amount of information. Now, is the information that they have access to informing them of their um of their social status or is it informing them of their victimhood is that where they're getting it from or are they just more intelligent because of the information they have access to or is it the problem of the parents are the parents molly coddling their children i mean and what does that look like wrapping them up in wool don't know Okay, well, there are some states where it is illegal for their child to walk around in the community without an adult. And leaving a child alone at home is legal when he or she is 10 years of age or mm-hmm. older. So, I mean, that's definitely counter to you and I, Jeff, because I just seem to recall we could pretty much do whatever we wanted. Our, our parents were particularly lax at this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think that that applies to most parents in the west i I just you know i just i don't believe that for a second i think i think it's the media i think the media is to blame it makes a massive case out of small beans when it comes to being offended being oppressed not having rights I, i just think it's absolute nonsense i mean the the um what's a big one the Gender imbalance in pay, the pay imbalance between the genders, total nonsense, a total myth. It's a total media lie. You know, especially in this country, it's illegal. Uh, so for the media, will just continue lying, just lying. If ever you say something like that, you have to immediately back it up. So why don't you explain well, why it's a lie? In, in this country, the UK, it is illegal not to pay two people the same wage for the same job it is against the law you cannot do it it doesn't happen (laughs) and then you have other considerations like the statistics that are drawn up on this topic include the time women take off from work to have children men typically do not take a year off to have a child right That doesn't happen. Women very often do. And when you include that in the statistics, yes, indeed, it looks like men get paid more because they're at work more. They're simply there. They're present where the women are not. And then when women return to work, typically with children, they do not go back to work full time. Typically, the men do after their two weeks of paternity leave. And these 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 days not worked are included in the statistics. So of course it looks like women get less money. But when you know why, then you can see that there is no imbalance. So it's a total myth, total myth. Now, I have heard arguments on both sides of that. So much so, I don't know what to believe. Because there are people just as passionate as you just then who speak on the other side of that. And then there's you and various other people who speak on your side of the argument. I just don't know what to believe. It's like, what the hell? It's, it's, it's a world of confusion. And I think the media spins that confusion to its favor. It, the media wants sensationalism and it wants conflict because it needs, it needs stuff to report. I, I just think it's strange that you put the blame squarely on the media for the delicate snowflake phenomena. Well, I don't. I just said it's a possibility. I don't. I'm just, I'm just, I don't really know what the cause is, but it wouldn't surprise me if it is fully the media that whips up everybody into a frenzy, and and you know constantly and just tells you you are a victim, you need to fight for your rights, whether or not that's true. <laughs> it's just what you know. You're a woman, therefore you are oppressed. What? And it's particularly hilarious in the West because just look at the other countries. 
I mean, you think you think you're oppressed? I mean, seriously? Look, look at these other countries. You know, if you actually, it's like feminism, for instance, which we've spoken about. Uh, if you were truly, truly, truly into feminism, and you were a proper, true feminist who wanted to fight for the cause, you need to immediately leave this country and go to a country like Saudi Arabia, where women are really being oppressed. You're not just having their feelings hurt about something, literally being, you know, banned from driving and banned from walking around or going anywhere on their own, banned from leaving the country. You know, but but no, we can't do that because we need to accommodate the cultures of the, you know, we need to we need to welcome the Saudi Arabians who come into this country, you know, because it's their culture, even though it's completely at odds against everything that you might believe in this country. So it's a crazy, mixed up, topsy turvy world, and I think political correctness is something that needs to be a big topic, and we have to have a conversation about it, even though. <laughs> <laughs> that's not really what it's all about. So we will see what Trump does, if he does anything at all. But I'll be very interested to see if anything changes in the future, because at the moment we have these pronouns, the personal pronouns that nobody understands, Z and here, and what are, what's all that about? How can you possibly keep up with all of that? It's too complicated for starters. More than two genders? I mean, it's already, it's it's a lot to ask most people to consider. And it's even more of an ask to ask to, to make people get it right. That doesn't bother me. I mean, people can call themselves whatever they want. The only thing that bothers me is when I'm somehow branded a bad person for getting it wrong. For getting yeah. it wrong. Or, or Yeah, well, that's the point. Yeah, I, abs- I feel exactly the same way. They, they, can, they can call themselves whatever they want. They just can't expect me to keep up with all that. <laughs> exactly. So I don't want to be embarrassed or humiliated because I got that wrong. Yeah. They, they, they should be the ones who are adapting, not everybody else. And that, that's the problem. It's completely on, you know, it's been turned over. You, There's something that annoys me a little bit about some of this. And it's that someone who is classed as a non-minority will need to constantly be atoning. And it's a kind of tone that I'm always hearing from the BBC, for example. Yeah, which is, which is just as offensive. I mean, I, I think, I think the fact, I mean, you could see it this way. The fact that it's okay to insult white people because you know they can handle it. That's basically saying they can handle it and nobody else can. So what, how does, how does that work in your favor as a non-white minority? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can insult the white, the white people because, you know, they're tough enough to handle it. But anybody else? Oh, no, no. Well, crap. We, we've spoken about this in other shows, but I got a whole ton of abuse for speaking in an American accent in the UK. And that's fine. Who cares? <laughs> Americans can take it. Good. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's the sort of thing that needs to stop. It's this this allowing people to be racists and to insult people. It's like, hang on a minute. You can't do that. You know, you stop being such a hypocrite. You need to stamp down on people who are, who are doing that sort of thing. And uh, it, because it's just as bad as from any other angle. And I think that that is a seriously terrible part because it's affirmative action. Um, political correctness is affirmative action. Polit- political correctness is a weapon that can be used by some people, but not everyone. It depends who you are. And again, that's identity politics. And that, that's where we're disappearing down, this, this filter. And uh, if Trump does anything, if he can address that, um, that'll be fantastic. It's like Hillary Clinton, when uh, there was a shooting in Chicago, uh, you know, she immediately said there's a gun problem. And it's like, hang on a minute. It, in that instance, in South Chicago, you know, it was black people killing black people in an area where black people kill black people. And the vast majority of people who are killed are black. The vast majority of people who are doing the killing are black. It's a total black issue. So instead of saying it's a gun issue, which it absolutely isn't, because the vast majority of gun owners in the United States are perfectly responsible. It's just this particular geographic area. To say it's gun control is offensive to everyone who owns a gun and all right-thinking, reasonable people in the United States. What she should have said is... There's a black problem in the South Chicago, 
and you know we need to sort it out that's what she should have said but she's politically correctly and that's a ridiculous term because it's not just simply not correct uh, didn't say that it's a gun problem the guns are literally leaping off the desks and shooting everybody in south chicago i think she could have been a little bit more honest and truthful in that instance but where she absolutely is never honest and truthful is when it's an act of islamic terrorism so for example that uh, orlando nightclub shooting there again she spoke about we need tighter gun laws and someone i know whose name escapes me asked what on earth would she have said if it wasn't guns that this um islamic inspired terrorist used yeah if it was if it were all done with swords would she have said, machetes, yeah what would she have said well no well she would have said there's a knife problem she would have said there's a the marathon boston marathon bombers who used those pressure cookers yeah so if this guy would use pressure cookers yeah. to kill that many people what would she have said would she have had to confront the problem well, we, we need to have licensing for pressure cookers yeah she would have been forced to confront the problem indeed i mean <laughs> she said um yeah, Islamic terrorism, that's a tricky one. I mean, you could say, if you were a total cynic, you could say she doesn't want to upset Muslims or any minorities because that's where her votes come from. Didn't she get a lot of money from the Saudi government, her and Clinton? Oh, hugely. Yeah, the Saudi. I think it was the Saudi Arabians or the Qataris. Maybe the Saudi Arabians gave Bill a million dollars. Just gave, gave him a million dollars. They gave half a million dollars. I um, don't think he returned it. But the, the, the thing is, and this is why that whole sleepwalking towards Armageddon is very apt it's because failure to call a spade a spade for example in the orlando nightclub shooting could lead to us not being sufficiently prepared for further acts of pure hatred we won't see it coming because we're not profiling yeah Yeah, it's true but this is all so politically incorrect (laughs) it is it is but i mean god you know i mean how much trouble can you get in I mean, you, you have to look at the ev- – it's, it's down to reason. Look at the reason and evidence and don't make political statements out of emotion. That's the worst thing you can do. If you get all emotional, then you make horrific mistakes. And Angela Merkel and her seeing that posed, drowned boy on the beach, apparently oh, yeah. that – Whoa, whoa apparently what are you that- talking about? Apparently, posed? Yeah, it was posed. It was, the, it was this, a photo. I'm not saying that they killed killed a child just to make a photograph, but you know, it was. They thought about the photograph and thought about the timing and everything. Quite a lot of who, engineering went into it. The who? photographer, really? Yeah. Oh, probably. And, yeah, and but anyway, oh, you, you made it sound much like a much larger conspiracy. No, no, no it's no conspiracy. Um, but you know, photographers are photographers, right? They're they're going to set their shots and set it up, and you know, maximum impact. You know, they. They're paid, uh, and everybody want, wants to take the perfect photograph. You know, they're they're very, you can't you can't be a successful photographer who only takes opportunistic photos, right? They're, they're like you know lightning. That's how rare they are to get a truly truly spontaneous opportunistic photo. All photographers pose their shots and everything. But anyway, that one photograph, uh, you know, very emotive. Uh, Angela Merkel apparently said, "Yeah, let's let a million." Um, refugees and immigrants into Germany because of that photograph. And you think, well, that's absolutely not when you want to let your emotions, you know, override your judgment. Um, th- th- that That's a real problem. And you have to have a robust conversation about these situations in order to fully dig out all of the relevant information. You know, you have to be have a, have a, a sober discussion about tough topics and that will become less frequent with political correctness i mean i can imagine the debates uh, you know prime minister's questions and the debates in the houses of parliament will be a lot less direct because of the offense potential you know the, the offense that, that could be taken and of course when people take offense what happens do they die immediately do they just combust uh, you know it, that doesn't happen somebody is offended and you know they're offended and they need to get over it. And everybody needs to get over it. And if apologies are required, you know, forgiveness must be sought uh, if it's, uh, you know, hate speech or unnecessarily offensive. But we have to have this to and fro because the, the whole silos thing is just is just not sustainable. And I think it's a it's a real problem. So anyway, watch this space. Perhaps we'll revisit it. 
Um, we've written quite a lot of notes here, but is there anything else we need to cover? Or are we sufficiently? I think we're good, and we've we've done the full one hour twenty minutes. So I think we're probably. All right, let me just have a look. All right. Well, with well, that, well there are some things you oh. didn't mention. Hang, hang on. There's some things you didn't mention. Like you put this photograph of this dog. <laughs> uh, I've never heard anything about this. What is this? Okay, so this is just a story. This was um, Jeremy Clarkson, who is a presenter on a show called. It's a car show called Top Gear for many years. He was a presenter and he's also a writer and a columnist and a general broadcaster. And he's renowned for being a bit anti-PC uh, and a bit of a, of a risk uh, with his producers. Um, a I, I of, describe him as fearless. Yeah, a couple of years ago, he uh, was fired from his job at Top Gear with the BBC because I think he's of some sort of violent altercation. Anyway, uh, I have a little quotation here from him where he says, I remember being called in to see Danny Cohen. I think this was his the head of the BBC, his d- department. Uh, I trudged all the way over the broadcasting to, to the broadcasting house, and he said, I understand you have a new dog and you have called it Didier Dogba. It is racist. I said, it is not racist. We are all Chelsea fans in the family. And he said, please tell me the dog is not black. And I said, it's a Scottish terrier. Should I have called it John Terrier? So the football player mentioned is a black football player. And and the dog is a black dog. So his producer sees this as racist. The defense is that they are Chelsea fans and his name is Dogba, the football player. So it's a tricky one because how you sort of have to think about it to take offense. And should you take offense? Is it offensive? Perhaps it is. Perhaps it isn't. How much offense do you take? The dog is black. The human is black. And, of course, the human is not black. The, the human is brown, right? The dog is actually black. So the, even there, the color is not the same. And it's that sort of thing. And the BBC is kind of a left-leaning, I mean, like most media outlets, left-leaning, um, megalithic uh, uh, broadcasting entity. And in the case of the BBC, it's funded by taxpayers basically it's tax funded so it doesn't have to make a profit it can be weaponized political correctness can be weaponized it's like when you just blindly click the box yes i accept to the apple uh end user license agreement which is fifty seven thousand miles long and about sixty thousand words you don't read it nobody reads it but you tick the box so it's as if you're being pre-criminalized you know at any moment, somebody could break down the door, rush in, and throw a black bag over your head uh, because little known to you, and unintentionally, you actually broke the law. And I think that's where we're headed. We're headed to the point where we're all just sitting criminals, and if we do anything wrong, we can easily be incarcerated because of X, Y, and Z that we were unaware of. So it's the difference between intentional hate speech and accidental um, offense. And with that, I will say you have been listening to Eclecticist Podcast. Uh, our shows are all available on our website, eclecticist.co.uk, where you can also find the notes to all of our programs. There's a small feedback form at the bottom of the page. If you fill that in, you can give us an idea of what we should be talking about next time. Or if you have any general feedback, just pop it in there and uh, we'll give it a read. Uh, thank you very much for listening we don't know what we're going to be talking about next time but if you have any ideas please send it along Um, you have been listening to me Jeffrey Campos and my brother Ben DeCampos thank you very much and good evening